country's unbroken circle. We've all heard it said, who's going to fill their shoes? Who will fill the shoes of the country greats like Hank Williams, Loretta, Dolly, and others? Who comes next to dig even deeper into the country music roots planted by folks like Charlie Pride, Bill Anderson, Grandpa Jones, and more? That's what this series is all about. We've asked the country's family reunion artists to invite those who they feel will walk into the next generation, the singers, the writers, those who understand that at the core of country is the same message, faith, family, real life, real stories. And we think you'll agree that country's future is in good hands. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? Welcome to Country's Unbroken Circle. Another family reunion. What a good looking bunch we got in the circle today, and a very special family reunion called Country's Unbroken Circle. Before we do anything else, though, I need to go to T. Graham Brown because he has a very special announcement to make a, a news bulletin, right? Yeah, it actually is a news bulletin. This woman beat her husband up with his guitar collection, and she went before the judge. He said, First offender, and she says, No, sir, first a Gibson, then offender. <laughs> It doesn't get any better, folks. <laughs> uh, well, the idea for Country's Unbroken Circle, we talk so much in country music about circles and unbroken circles, and we sing the song, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? And at the Opry House, there's the circle there in the middle of the stage that most of us have stood on and feel so honored to stand on every time that we get that opportunity. So with Country's Unbroken Circle, we got a lot of familiar faces here. I started to say old faces, but I, familiar faces, Jeannie. <laughs> And some folks that are with us for the very first time. And these are the people that are going to help keep the circle unbroken and help right. take country music on to wherever it's going from here. So it's just great to have everybody here and you too, Sally. Oh, thanks, Bill. That's great. And by the way, just in case anybody asks, you and I are longtime friends. We are not old friends. All right. Long time. Keep that phrase in mind. <laughs> Neil, you'll need to know that because you're edging up there, you know. Yeah, see, I am know. edging. Yeah, so edging. what was it you told me the other day? You went from being... Uh, oh, what, <laughs> talking about... I think this mic is working, so I think I'm all right on this. Oh, anyway, okay. yeah, yeah, I wanted to save your back there <laughs> in these times, you know. Yeah, they were talking about being a senior, and I said, well... I've gone straight from having blonde moments right into senior moments. I haven't noticed much difference. <laughs> <laughs> Never did know where I was going. Hey, Bill, you know? they, they don't call us old anymore. They call us legacy artists. <laughs> they that's made a nice. really nice term, legacy artists. Yeah, that's nice. Legacy sounds better yeah, than old. Yeah, much better. <laughs> now, is that hashtag? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Daryl McCall is, is a legacy. Oh, my God. He's a yes, legend. When I first came to Nashville, one of the first tours I ever went on, Daryl went to help me drive and pick guitar and sing, so we go back about 250 years, buddy. I think so. Hitler was a corporal, wasn't he? I think he was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we've had a lot of, lot of miles and a lot of That's music. Sweet. I can't think of anybody better to start off the music Ooh. today than to go down to, to the Lone Star State of Texas where this old boy hangs his hat these days. And uh, he's brought somebody special with him that we'll meet a little bit later on. Sorry, what'd you say, Bill? I'm sorry. I said, here's Daryl McCall. Oh, yeah. This and is I me. hope you get a large charge. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to start off. You know, we do go back a long ways, Bill. Yeah, we do. 
there's some stories back there, you know, but I, I'll just leave a lot of them out. Promise not to tell them. <laughs> I want to go back and get one of my favorite songs that we recorded back, I guess this is back in the uh, 70s. A guy named Little Joe Carson had the first record on this. And I heard it, Joe met his death. He had an accident and uh, lost his life. And his songs had just started being played. So I cut this song just to keep it out there because I loved it so much. It's called Helpless. It goes like this. Ready? Helpless. That's what I'd be without your lips and your arms to hold me tight. That's what I'd be without that dream of you with me every night. Well, I feel so weak inside. Job. Stay there. Stay there to my. Okay. You mentioned Little Joe Carson. Yes. Did you ever know a song of his or hear one called Passion and Pride? Oh, my goodness, that goes back a ways. You Along know? Along with back in my disc jockey days, which was yes. a long time ago, I used to play that record and I wow. thought it was so good. I thought he was an excellent singer. He really you know? was, yeah. From Oklahoma, wasn't he? I'm not sure. I never met I him. I think he was from Oklahoma. But I sure enjoyed his music. I met his son and his, his uh, wife not, uh, back years ago. And they had a suit that he'd bought of mine that I had Nudie make. I designed the suit, and I couldn't pay for it, so Nudie, Nudie had it in his window. And little Joe needed a, a suit, and he was out in California, and he spotted it, bought that suit, and wore it for quite a while. It had my name on the inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, a, he was one of my favorite singers. You lived in Nashville for a long time. You worked with Ray Price. You worked with Farron Young. You worked with all kinds of folks. Why Bill did you Anderson. leave here and go to Texas? Well, I followed my music. Uh, I was into the old traditional, of course I still am, and I'm into the old traditional kind of music that you can dance to. And you know, I, I look at the fact that a lot of the music today has gone in different directions. They're calling a lot of music country that's j just off in another vein that I don't understand. So I'm basically trying to keep our music alive uh, with the fiddles and the steel. I love to see people dancing. I figured when the good Lord gave us a a talent to use, we'd better use it, you know. So, and he gave us these two things to see with, and these two things to hear with, and this to feel with. And our country music, to me, has always been story songs and things that you can relate to, that you can feel, as well as hear. I remember used to, used to I'd get in my truck to go feed or something in the morning, and I'd hear a good country song, and you'd hum it all day long, you know. A lot of times nowadays, you turn the radio on, you can't hum that. <laughs> you, can't, you hear it, but you just can't hum it, you know? So I'm trying to keep our music alive. 
and I got a lot of help doing it, too. Well, you're doing a great job of it, too. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that. I, I got to mention... I got to mention your harmony singer on that song you just oh, sang. Oh, goodness. You know, you've, you've met that old boy somewhere before, haven't you? Oh, uh, yeah. I think I know him pretty well. That's my little brother, Dennis. When you came to Nashville, you told everybody you were Donnie Young, who we all knew later in life as Johnny Paycheck. You told everybody you and Johnny Paycheck were brothers. Now, why'd you do that? Well, he told me, he said, you know, let's change our name to Young. And we'll go as a brother act in Nashville and take over, you know, because we thought we really had it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we changed our name to Daryl and Donna Young as the Young Brothers, but we got to Nashville, and there was so many brother acts. There was the Wilburn Brothers, the Leuven Brothers, the Stanley Brothers, the McCormick Brothers. They didn't want another brother act. (laughs) So if it hadn't been for you and Buddy Kiln and a bunch of us taking me off the side and asking me to sing harmony with you... You know, I don't know what had happened today. But I was fortunate. I grew up with people like Bill and, and uh, Paycheck, of course. He's always been one of my favorite singers. Ray Price, the great Farron Young, Carl Smith, people like this. They kind of raised me in the music business and taught me a certain kind of music that I love with all my heart. And I'm going to sing it as long as the good Lord gives me a breath. Good for you. Well, now, you brought somebody with you that's really no stranger to us because he has been in the circle with us before. But I think you want to shine a very special spotlight on this young man over to your right. I'm so proud of him. I've known this guy for quite a while, and uh, they've always asked me, who do I think that would carry on our slot, you know, once I, I'm not able to do it? This guy is also one of my producers, and uh, he knows every country song that you'd ever want to know. <laughs> and he would keep our dance music and our country music alive with the fiddles and the steel. I want you all to listen to him sing. In case you never have heard him, this is one of the best friends I have. And he's from Texas. He lives there in Brady, Texas. Right down the street from me, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I want you all to say hi to Justin Trevino, would you please? Yeah. This is a good singer. Hello, Justin. All right. Hello, Bill. Thank you, Daryl. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing a song. I'm actually going to sing a Bill Anderson song. And uh, Bill wrote, this is one of my favorite country songs of all time. And Daryl touched on something a second ago. He was talking about being able to feel a song and a song that tells a story. I think one of the reasons I love this song so much is because I can hear the lyrics and I can envision all of this in my mind. And uh, I want you all to listen to this. Call that's what it's like to be lonesome. Yes. The streets are dark and empty, and you walk them. and pray you'll never see the dawn afraid of each tomorrow with its heartless cold unknown and that's what it's like to be lonesome with the heart a broken love has taught to cry That's what it's like to be lonesome. I know, cause I'm a mighty lonesome guy. Thank you. You search to find a tavern. Where the music's playing loud You try to lose your heartache In the laughter of the crowd But the happy couples make you think Of things that might have been And you have to fight the teardrops Till you're by yourself again the crowd. 
Thank you, Justin. Yes, sir. Justin Trevino. Justin, you, we mentioned, or Daryl mentioned the word uh, Brady, Brady, Texas. Yes. Uh, that's where you live. That's where there's a record company called yes. the Heart of Texas Records that we're all familiar with, our friend Tracy Pitcox and all. You produce a lot of those records, or virtually all I, of them, don't I you? I do. I produce the majority of them. There's a few that uh, people have their own studios and things like that, but I produce the majority of them and engineer. You know, they've given, they've paid me a lot of compliments as a record producer down through the years. Really, I set out to be an engineer, a, a recording engineer. I started producing because there wasn't a producer in the producer chair, and I started making decisions. But really, uh, I look up to uh, to the record producers that, uh, you know, the guys in Nashville like Joe Allison and Pete Drake and Chet Atkins and, you know, uh, Don Law and, and Frank Jones and the guys that made the records that I loved were trying to continue something on. I didn't have to invent this stuff. It was already there for me to listen to and go, okay, that's how you do it, you know. And so I just, I, we try to preserve the sound of the, of the music that we love so much and, and uh and so many of our, uh, of, well, like yourself and Jeannie and so many of the people that I look up to. And I'm, I'm uh, so proud to, to be here and be included. But trying to sing in front of all of you guys is kind of like trying to bake a cake for Betty Crocker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you did well. You <laughs> baked you. a good cake. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Justin, much continued good luck and success to you, and keep that country music coming out of Brady, Texas. Oh, thank you, Bill. All right, great. Yeah. Justin Trevino. Daryl, thank you for bringing Justin by. What a, what a cool guy and what a, a tremendous fact, talent. I I think we did that record together, didn't we, Bill? Well, that's, that's what, what it's like, like to be lonesome. And 99 years. Well, I know you and I sang it a whole bunch of times. We recorded it. Yeah, you were on the original record yes. with me. Wow. Yeah. It goes back farther than I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daryl McCall and well, Justin Trevino. Charlie McCoy sitting way over there in the corner. Uh, yeah. what, what are you? Are you doing your own little sound check over there with your harmonica? Well, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, they all look alike. I had to make sure I had the right one. <laughs> you told me something very interesting yesterday at rehearsal. You're getting ready to go back to France to perform, and you've performed over there how many times? I've, re I've performed in 97 towns in France, some of them more than once. I was going to say, I didn't know there were 97 <laughs> towns in France. <laughs> no, there's a ton of them, but no, I have. And the one thing I'll tell you about France, I've never played a show that started on time. And nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> They're uh, enjoying the, uh, the fruits of the vine in oh, France. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> Why is it that, that your music is, I mean, your music is popular all over the world, but I, I kind of get the feeling that maybe France is, is very special. Why, why is that, you think? Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, it, country music is big all over Europe, but somebody asked me why I played in France so much. I said, because I play the French harp. <laughs> Boots. <laughs> Where's the drums at? Yeah. Rim shot. Have you have you performed? I'm I'm sure you probably have in Asia, Japan, China. I have I've been there. Twenty times in Japan. Wow. Yeah. Well, it just proves that music is really the international language. Absolutely. Yes. Can you speak French? You've been to ninety-seven towns. Ah, uh, yeah. J'ai joué à 97 villes en France. That says I've played in 97 towns in France. <laughs> I can speak with a six-year-old. <laughs> can you speak French, Celie? Yeah. No. I can't, I can't understand it either, so. <laughs> I can say Eiffel Tower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bridget Bardo. Of course, you can, all I can of do. course you can say Bridget Bardo. Yeah. Charlie, what's your biggest hit in France? What do they know you the most for? Uh, Orange Blossom Special. They just, you know, they love music that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about laying something good on us today and then well, introducing right. somebody that you brought from the Country Music Hall of Fame, the great Charlie McCoy, probably paid on more phonograph records than anybody in 
Nashville history. Well, you know, this room is full of so many great singers, that a lot of them who I've recorded with, and I'm going to do you all a favor. I'm not going to sing today. <laughs> this is a song from a brand new album called Country Gold. Charlie, you were so great to call out the guys in the band. It made me wonder, do you take Nashville musicians when you go overseas? I uh, have. I have sometimes, but uh, not always. You well, know. do you find that the musicians over there, do you take charts or arrangements or anything? Yes, and the musicians over there are so enamored with the musicians over here that they study them and they and they learn. I, I know that uh, Jeannie and... Uh, 
and uh, Johnny and I have been to Japan each, and uh, the, the guys in Japan are now learning the Nashville number system. <laughs> no, it's very cool. When you do an album, like you said, you've got an album called Country Gold. Of course, that's a great always on my mind. Right. I'm sure everybody knew that. How do you go about picking the songs? I mean, you can name millions of songs that are Country Gold. Is there a certain thing you look for for the harmonica? Something would fit better than something else? Well, a lot of songs sound better on harmonica. The great thing about this Country Gold idea is that the, the choices are almost unlimited. There's so many, so many great, great songs, you know. So it's easy to find them. So sometimes it's hard to decide. Yeah, which ones to leave out. Right, yeah. right. But that's why this will be volume one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll look forward to all the volumes. You brought somebody special today as we continue Country's Unbroken Circle. Yes, I did. Uh, I brought a friend of mine who uh, I've known since the 70s. She toured with my band for about 10 years. She's done guest appearances on 10 of my albums. So I want you all to welcome one of my very favorite singers from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Miss Lainey Smallwood. All right, Lainey, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Do we all have to say Roll Tide? Well, of course we do. Where am I going here? Roll Tide indeed. I spent 40 years in Nashville. Um, I'm sad to say I never did become a UT fan because if you're from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, you are an Alabama football fan for life. So, and now I'm back down there, but uh, uh, I am a, an Alabama fan, but I am a country music fan. And I'm grateful, I'm grateful, because I know something about country music that does make it different to me from the other music, aside from what all of you stars know that the reason country music is an unbroken circle for me, I love this name, because I didn't become a star. I came to town in 77, signed with Monument Records with uh, Fred Foster, and they put me on the road. I was 20 and innocent, and they put, Fred put me on the road with Charlie because, number one, he's a genius, and he knew that between him and his band, which was Barefoot Jerry, uh, that I'd be in really good hands musically, and with him I'd be in good hands because he's a true gentleman. And, and he is, he still is, my best, he's my brother. But what I learned was that in this family of people, of musicians, you do become family, and you don't make music, you experience it together. And you know what I'm talking about. We have more fun on the bandstand. We don't really need the audience, but it's okay if they're there. <laughs> and and the, the thing is you do, you experience it. And I experienced making really good music and I knew what was happening among us. And these boys became my family. And I'll tell you something, even without stardom, I've had the time of my life making music. Are you still singing and performing down in Tuscaloosa? Uh, when he calls me, when he calls me, I come. Because I'm also really particular, and it'll ruin you to play with really good musicians. So I only sound good if I'm playing with really good musicians. <laughs> the best advice my daddy ever gave me, he was a wonderful singer, but his, he said, just make sure you're always the, the least talented person in the band. And that was never really hard to pull off <laughs> up here. So um, that worked out really well for me. But uh, Charlie McCoy is my brother and mentor. And thank you for letting me hang out with you music people for all those years. What are you going to sing? <laughs> I'm going to sing probably the first song I ever heard. Heard my daddy sing it, and I've loved it all my life. I still do. The last letter, uh, everybody's recorded it, but when I got lucky enough to get the Grand Ole Opry to come in and I could hear Jack Green do it, I just I cried all the way through it every time. But I do want to sing that for y'all today. It's a sad song. Wow. It's a sad song, but it's, God, it breaks your heart. It's country music at its best. If you're miserable, someone's done a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Why 
do you treat me as if I were only a friend? What have I done that has made you so distant and cold? Sometimes. I've admired you from afar so very long. I'm looking around the room while you're singing, and everybody is sitting there thinking, why was this lady not a big star? <laughs> My goodness gracious, Bless that is you. tremendous. The late Rex Griffin wrote that song. Yes. I was wondering, and I know Celie was, oh, because man. she worked for so you many years with Jack me. Green. <laughs> that ending that Thanks. Jack Green put on his oh, record, oh. I was wondering if you were going to do oh. that. Yeah. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you no. could do it. I know that. But Charlie, thank you so much hey. for bringing Lanny. My goodness. Hey. I think you're going to do another one before the day's over, aren't you? Going to do a little tribute to Buddy Emmons later on. Oh, yeah. all right. 
Laney Smallwood, Roll Tide, Alabama. <laughs> I, have, I have to tell you that uh, Laney kind of got me on that one because that song kind of launched a, a duet team because I was still living in California and the radio, I heard this record, Jack's record of the last letter and I called the radio station and said, who is that singing the last letter? And they said, Jack Green. And I said, who is Jack Green? <laughs> and that's when he said he, he plays drums for Ernest Tubb. And that's yeah. a cut out of the Texas Troubadour album. So, of course, I immediately went and got the album. And when I came back to Nashville the first trip, they said, who do you want to meet? Especially here in Nashville. And I said, Jack Green and Connie Smith. Those were my people I wanted to meet. So that kind of... Uh, launched a duet career, you know, you might say, because when I had the opportunity then to go to Decca Records and, and record with Jack, it was just a great time. But thank you, Laney. You did a great job on it. You got me, though. <laughs> okay, so at the end of the song, is, is the singer, the guy that, of course, Rex Griffin wrote it, is he committing suicide? Is he ending his life? Is that what he means by... I'll be gone when you read this last letter from me. How do you well, interpret I, you that? Well, you know, I always thought that, but and I think it can mean a couple things because it really can mean that he's just done. But as we all know, when you lose love and when you walk away from it, when you let go, it's a death. And maybe he's just done and he's walking away. Either way, it hurts really bad. It does. It's yeah. a hey, sad, Bill. sad Even song, but it's right beautiful the way that y'all did it. Bill, can I say something? Yeah, Eddie Raven. My dad played with Rex Griffin when I was a little kid. Really? And two songs I remember always hearing was Last Letter and Little Red Wagon. Won't you ride in my oh, little yeah. red wagon? And my yeah. dad played with prof We were in Savannah, Georgia, and my dad's South Georgia guy. And uh, I remember that I must have been three or four years old, and he, they had a radio show. And Roy Clark and I spoke about this the last time he, I was in when he was here. And I wasn't sure a whole lot, because I was pretty young, and my dad didn't play with him that long. But uh, that's not how he made a living. But. Well, I always thought Rick Griffin was from Texas. Was he from Georgia? I thought, according to Roy, he was from maybe Virginia or, or uh, North Carolina, one of the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. But I always thought it was a suicide note. And... Uh, uh, well, nothing like a good suicide note to cheer everybody up today. <laughs> That's how I took it, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, Acuff told me one time, he said, you're too realistic. <laughs> he said what? He said, you are too realistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, sing a little bit of Little Red Wagon and get us back in an up-tempo mood. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Won't you ride in my Little Red Wagon? I would love to well, you take you down the street. It. All the boys in the I neighborhood. All the kids yeah. will be there. There you go. They yeah. see my playmates. So Two sweet. songs I remember about Griffin was <laughs> that. And well, they, they both left a mark in their day. Oh, yeah. Apparently, yeah. she didn't ride in his little red wagon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why he wrote the last letter. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Dwayne is Allen, it's a little unusual to see you without those three other honchos that are usually hovering around you. Well, they're. Uh, somewhere else, and it's not my time to watch them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't really know where they are, but when Terry called me, I jumped at the opportunity to come here because this is a very special program to me. Well, I, you're I, very I, special to us, and you've been here before yes, uh, with the guys. And I've been, been here by myself, your own, and, yeah. and, and my wife sings, wife, and my yes. daughter's here singing yeah. back up, and it's kind of a family thing for us, and I get to see friends that I don't get to see any other time of the year when I come out here. And I'm very much a, a respectful person of our foundation. And I get to see a lot of people here that pave the way for a lot of others to follow. And it's good to uh, associate and, and uh, talk. Eddie and I were talking back about backstage before we got started. We'd been talking about 30 minutes, and I came out here and saw we were seated next to each other. I said, we can just continue. And, and that's kind of how it is. You just pick up with old friends where yeah. you left off. And yet your roots at the very beginning were in gospel music rather than country. We sang Southern-style gospel quartet music, 
Uh, that's kind of a, a crazy trip for me because I have a degree in classical music. And so going from the Metropolitan Opera to the Grand Ole Opry is quite a trip. Yeah. And I'm somewhere in the middle of all of that. I just wanted to learn how to do it right when I was young, but I knew where I wanted to be and it's where I wound up. But I had to study classical music because there wasn't any other type of music being taught in colleges at that time. Mm -hmm. So I told the head of the college, I want to go to gospel or country music and it's a simple form of music, but I want to go there and make it better. And he said, well, I'll help you do that. Right. And uh, he put me with an old, old school vocal, vocal coach and he put me with the head tenor of the Metropolitan Opera who had just moved to East Texas State College where I went, now Texas A&M. And uh, he was do studying his, to get his doctorate, R.G. Webb. And uh, when he graduated, he went to the Met went to uh, London Philharmonic Orchestra to become their lead tenor. So I got to study with some really good people, and they taught me how to, you know, put the music out there instead of keeping it inside of you, and how to uh, sing without a microphone, and project it, and how to make the needle come up like that instead of going off the charts. And I think probably the different kinds of teaching that. Uh, I went through has helped me to never have a vocal problem for 53 and a half years. So. Well, you were so lucky that you had somebody in your college that said, okay, I'll help you. You told him you wanted right. to go into country and gospel. The exact opposite happened with me. I was in a music class at the University of Georgia. It was called Music Appreciation. Of course. Uh, but uh, one day they were, the professor was talking about Bach or Beethoven or something, and I raised my hand and I said, is that the same thing as when Hank Williams did so and so and right. so and so? He looked at me and he said, Mr. Anderson, don't you ever mention the name Hank Williams in this room again. And I didn't because I got up and walked out and never went back. <laughs> <laughs> but you got encouragement and, and, and I didn't and that, that's a good thing. Well, you know, those people, uh, when you study classical music, those names are very familiar because that's where the form of music took shape. They're the ones that uh, put the one, three, and five, which we call a tonic chord, a major chord. And I learned the number system in classical music. When I came to Nashville, I already knew the number system, but I didn't know that that's what they called it here. But uh, it was easy for me to transition from that because I already knew it. And uh, writing music and composing orchestrations, and you you learn all that stuff. and. It was very easy to come here and learn, learn the number system, how it worked. I was fascinated by it because, you know, I knew immediately where they were going with it. Wow. And it, it, it's really a, a simple way of learning the basic form of classical music. And classical music teachers call the other stuff jazz. And not jazz like the music jazz, just like all that jazz, you know. <laughs> it, get away from it. They call everything else that. So. <clears throat> That's what I had to live with, but they knew where I wanted to go. My brother and sister had preceded me in the same college with the same teachers. And one became a school teacher, one became a music missionary. I didn't want to do either. And I told the head of the college that. I said, I, I appreciate what they're doing. That's their goal, that, but that's not me. I want to go into a simpler form of music and make it better. And I've been able to do that in my way of thinking yes, you have. with gospel and country music. And uh, I found a welcome mat in both fields of music and I couldn't be happier. I've, I've lived my dreams many times already. And I have to sit back even today, sit back on my bus and just say, well, what else can I dream? Because if you have a dream, the next step is to build your business model. And you do one, two, three steps because that's the major chord. That's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's everything in threes. And you build a business model, one, two, three. Don't go to four, it gets too complicated, you can't remember it. Just one, two, three. Address the problem, figure out how to deal with it, and bring it home. It's just that simple. And it's right, writing music is the same way. You've got to start a subject matter and develop it and put a hook, like in, hook line in and bring it home. And music to me is pretty methodical. 
if you study it like a business, but in country and gospel music, they included the soul. And that's where I wanted to be. I didn't ever want to be at the Metropolitan Opera singing in a tuxedo. That's not me. I wanted to wear something like this and be here with you people <laughs> who sing for the soul, you know, and sing from the soul. Professor Dwayne Allen. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what you gonna sing today? We had a song by a man called Michael Foster. And back when Michael was around, we bought his catalog in our publishing company. And he had a song called Heart of Mine. It became a big number one country song. Went into the top, nat top natty songs in pop music for that year as well. And I kept look, digging in his catalog. I found a bunch more songs. And this one I found. And uh, we were in line to make this a single. And I was at a CMA award show. And Barbara Mandrell, who was on the same label, released a song that had the very same title. So we had to not do this one as a single. But we cut albums for every song we cut. We, we didn't cut favors for anybody. We cut songs, all of them were intended to be singles. If they didn't have that quality, we just didn't cut them. We didn't cut because somebody else in the group wrote a song. We don't write songs that much. So we didn't cut any favors. We cut songs that had the potential to be a hit. And this song, I think, could have been a hit had it been a single, but they usually just did two or three per album. It's called, I Wish You Were Here, Oh My Darling. Barbara right. Mandrell had, I Wish You Were Here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, lay it on us. Okay. Yes, 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 that's great. I wonder what that music professor thought when he heard, mm, papa, mama. <laughs> you, know, you know, the truth of that, that's a street, that's a street in East Nashville. And I looked at the um papa mau mau's the chug holes, potholes in the street. <laughs> and it's like riding silver for the Lone Ranger, hire your silver away. Yeah. It's that rough. <laughs> well, Dallas Frazier wrote that song about a, a street in East Nashville. So he knew that wouldn't sell on radio. So he had to write a story about a girl in it. So that's where the verses came in. And I first heard that song <clears throat> when I was with the Prophets Quartet a year before the Oak Ridge Boys. I sang with them a year. I was drafted, had to go to the Army. Got out of the Army, joined the Oak Ridge Boys the next day. And But while I was with the Prophets, Joe Muscale and I from the Prophets would come from Knoxville, Tennessee to Nashville. We would stay in the old Noel, Noel Hotel. There was a speaker on the wall. They only played on one station, WSM. One night, Ralph Emery, Tex Ritter, Marty Robbins was there, and a young man came in that had just had a big hit with Alley Oop, and his name was Dallas Frazier. This was 1966, in the, in the early part of the year, and he sang Elvira. I never forgot it. I just, I never forgot it. That's what a hit is. You have, have remembrance value, okay? Well, years pass. We're about to finish up I don't know, third or fourth album, Ron Chance, and he calls it, Ace, I've got this song that's different for the Oak Ridge Boy, but I think you'll like it. I said, well, bring it on, Ron. So I called all the guys. They came over to my house, and he started playing. I sang the whole song. I knew every bit of it. That's 15 years later. Never forgot it. That's what a hit potential has in it, remembrance value. He said, the only difference is we've got to get Joe to sing the verse, and we got to get Richard to sing this own Papa Mau Mau. So we imagined that song being a summer song where people would go on vacation before seat belts, and the kids, Mama would sing the verse, the kids in the back come up in between the two front seats, and then Daddy would do the own Papa Mau Mau. So we released it in time for it to hit in the summer, and all of those plans worked perfectly. <laughs> So you sometimes wonder what's behind the song. I always look for something I can, I can own. If I can't own it, I don't sing it. If it's about something I don't believe in, I don't sing it. 
Somebody else may do it, in the group may do it. And I'll back them up. I'll sing harmony with it. But if the message, the message of this first song just got to me the first time I heard it. The second verse doesn't necessarily fit me. But it's something that fits someone you know and someone that's close to you. And you've lived it with them because we live our life with and through our friends. And so I think you'll understand that when my wife sings the harmony with me and uh, the cheating and lying part. We'll see how she does that. <laughs> Good song, Dwayne. Great job. Thank you. You know what, think it, listening to the lyrics of that song, I couldn't help but think about something the great Owen Bradley used to say, one of the great record producers. Charlie worked for him. Many of us did. Owen used to say they got 57 flavors of ice cream, but vanilla still outsells them all. <laughs> and that song right there, Wish You Were Here, Oh My Darling, yeah. the, me and you, it, that's vanilla, but it outsells them all. That's what country music is that all about terrific, to me. It's just man. another way to say love. Yeah. You know, I love you in this way or that way, or I miss you. But it's all about love. 
That's what is so special to me about real country music. That's what we still talk about. That's what it all comes back to, yeah. is the real love stories. Here's a lady who knows a little bit about country music, bluegrass music, simple music. Do you, uh, Rhonda Vincent, do you have a, a, a philosophy of anything? Do you try to keep your music simple and, and, and yet, and I, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean in a way that communicates with people? Well, I think very authentic and very natural. I, I grew up in a musical family, and I think not necessarily bluegrass or country or gospel. When I was five, we had a television show, and that was made up of mom and dad, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends. And so there was a variety of music, and but it was it has that had that simplicity and that authenticity. Aunt Catherine sang; she sings like Kitty Wells, um, and yet my grandpa would probably sing a, a Bill Monroe song, and Uncle Pearl a Jimmy Martin song, and Mom a Loretta Lynn song. So uh, a, a wide variety, but I think there's something that. Uh, when we perform, I, I travel with incredible musicians, and I think at the forefront is that, uh, you know, it's so natural. It's the natural sound of the instruments. They take great care in selecting the instrument that they play. Um, and we don't use, I mean, there's not, uh, I guess, a lot. Of, there's no additives as, so, as far as technology. We use a microphone, but there, there are no tricks, I guess. It's, and I think it's something that I enjoy uh, is performing and whether we're on stage or we can just stand outside under the tree and it's the same sound. So that, to me, that's important. As a five-year-old, I want you had a television show. Did you think every five-year-old had a television show? You know, I, I really, we did. When I was, you know, it was on the job train and I started, my music is traced back five generations. My daughter, Sally, now carrying on the sixth generation of the Vincent family. My dad picked me up from school every day and we played and sang till dinner. After dinner, friends came over and there was a music party at my grandparents' house every night growing up. And that's what I thought everyone was at their house doing the same thing because that's, that's what we did. And for so many years, it wasn't until I got to be a teenager and I found out that Barb Wheeler and Tommy Parsons were at the skating rink and I wasn't. Then <laughs> I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, but, uh, but no, I, I am, I'm very grateful now. You know, well, you still team. carry on a lot of that. We, those of you who've been on our family reunion cruises know that we do our That's shows right. and then everybody mm -hmm. else, you know, kind of relaxes. Rhonda just keeps going right on down in the in the uh, the lobby of the ship and gets her <laughs> band and has the all night jams. We do. Yeah, we, we love I love hosting a jam. And that's something that is fun. And that's another thing. It's so natural. It's just bring your instrument bring your voice, whatever it is, and, and just join in. And, and I love that the authenticity of that. Yeah. Well, I'll bring your like, instrument in your voice right. and sing a song for I us. I will. <laughs>
think about where you might be I've written you a letter that I'd like to send If you would just send one to me Now I love you more than I loved you before And now where I'll find comfort God knows Cause you Just when I needed you most Yeah, you love me Just when I needed you most Yeah, you love me Just when I Pretty, pretty song, pretty lady, Rhonda Vincent. Rhonda, who wrote that song? Randy Van Warmer. Yeah. Warner. Yeah, great. And uh, this is not one that, it's another scenario that growing up in the musical family, we only listened to. My dad only thought bluegrass, gospel, and country is the only music that existed. It wasn't until I got to a junior high, and we're in study hall. If we were really good, we got to listen to the radio, and we got to <laughs> chew bubble gum. Mm. Only if it was really good day, if everybody was quiet. And it was a certain day, and we were there, everybody was good. So I always thought, please let us listen to the radio today. Please let everybody be quiet. Let's be good. We're getting our studies. And Just When I Needed You Most came on the radio. And it's not one that I would have ever been exposed to uh, at home yeah. because of that. But I love that song. Never uh, dreamed that I would ever sing that. But I think, thought it was so beautiful. It is a beautiful song, and you sang it beautifully. Tell Thank us you. about the uh, young lady that you brought here today. I am so excited to have her here with us today because I'm such a fan of hers. And uh, she sang with me on uh, our, the Christmas uh, CD. In fact, you're singing on there too, you and Jeannie, yeah. uh, on the 12 Days. Our celebrity, the Oak Ridge Boys are on there, the celebrity 12 Days of Christmas. But I am such a fan of hers, and, and I think authenticity is another word that describes her because she, she does, she sings and performs so naturally and is so authentic. She's so beautiful, and uh, here is Emmy Sunshine. Emmy, good to have you here. Of course, you've been, uh, you've been on the Opry. You have uh, probably know all these people from other places. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you now? I'm 14. It'll uh, be the last year I'll be able to ask her that without getting my face <laughs> slapped. But uh, where'd, where'd the hat come from? Um, one of my fans, they got it for me. I, I love old hats, so I just wear them wherever I go. How did you get started in music? At your age, you, you've been singing for how many years already? Oh, um, ever since I was around four years old, so it's really been a long, long time there. Um, it's been in my family for the longest time. I think three generations of my family there, and um, I remember listening to my grandmothers, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my dad, all of those people, and they were in a gospel group, and that's kind of where I started out. Um, I grew up in a Baptist church, and uh, we would listen to my grandmother sing all the time. My, my grandmother, she was just a beautiful soul, and I wanted to be just like her. So I started performing in churches. I started learning to play the ukulele. Um, and after a while, um, my dad said, well, I know that you love gospel music, and I know that you love all this, but do you want to do more? And I said yes. So he started working in country music, Americana, bluegrass. We just really kind of went with everything, really. So now I get questions like, are you bluegrass? Are you country? Are you Americana? I'm Emmy Sunshine. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Where did you grow up? What part of the country? Um, East Tennessee, around the Knoxville area. Uh -huh. A lot of country music and air in the water over there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you have any one particular person that you've tried to pattern yourself after? Or are you just being Emmy Sunshine? Well, you know, I've been inspired by all types of music. Jim Lauderdale over there. I mean, I mean, it's just been, my mom introduced me to so 
I mean, different types of music. I mean, I grew up listening to the Dixie Chicks. Um, oh, yeah. I started listening to a lot of um, Americana music. I mean, uh, um, that's what really interested me. I was really excited about that. And I started listening to a lot of Jason Isbell also. Um, then I got into Loretta Lynn and so many other people. And it just really, I'm inspired by all types. Do you write? Oh, absolutely. Um, my mom was a... Uh, my mom was a writer way before I was born, and um, she kind of let it go after a while. But uh, I, re I really started getting interested in it, and my mom said, "Well, we can we can try. You know, we can try writing a few things." And um, it's just been something. Uh, it's been more of a bonding experience between the both of us. I mean, I've been writing ever since I was five years old now. So it's goodness. Just... Did you write the song you're going to do today? I did. Lay it on us. All right. All right, 14 years old from East Tennessee. I saw her on the Steve Harvey show. Mm -hmm. She did a great job on Steve Thank Harvey. You. you were wonderful on oh, that. Oh, I try. <laughs> I'm going to do a song called When It Comes to Me. Sunshine. Wow. That is terrific. Absolutely terrific. Rhonda, thank you for bringing her. Oh, Country's pleasure. Unbroken Circle. You're looking at it right there. We got to take a break. We'll be back more on Country's Unbroken Circle later.